Good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you are today. I am Stuart Gandalf and welcome to How to Reduce No-Shows and Grow Your Behavioral Health Practice. Um, I'm really excited about this webinar today. We're looking forward to working with you. And uh, today I'm gonna be your MC and uh, host. And uh, let's go to the next slide and show off the stars. Um, I'm gonna be co-presenting with uh, two esteemed colleagues. Um, uh, our first uh, star coming up and guest uh, will be uh, Diego, Dr. Diego Garza. And uh, Dr. Garza is uh, VP of Innovation and Telemedicine of uh, MindPath Care Centers. Good morning, Dr. Garza. Good morning, everyone. Dr. Garza here, uh, VP of Innovation and Telemedicine, as Stuart was saying, happy to be here. Uh, and I look forward to uh, walking us through this webinar. Very good. So uh, Diego will be covering, he uh, has done some pretty amazing things. I know from experience of doing a lot of webinars that people love case studies. And so as we were planning this webinar, we looked for a terrific case study in the behavioral health field and exactly what we we're hoping for, a large um, uh, complex practices using some of the tools we're talking about today. And I think you'll find that story extremely compelling. And we'll be starting off with Dr. Garza. Uh, J.D. McFarland is an expert in this space. He's a solution architect for men. Um, J.D., tell us all about what you do and what men does. Hi, um, I'm a solution architect, which means I help figure out solutions for our customers. MEND is a patient engagement platform, which runs the gamut from telehealth, text notifications, patient self-scheduling, basically all the things necessary to conduct your practice in this new digital age that we live in. And I get to figure out how to put all the puzzle pieces together to make the best solution possible for you. Very good, awesome. All right, next slide, please. Uh, I'm gonna cover the agenda in just a moment. One bit of housekeeping to make sure everybody knows. Um, two questions we often get are, number one, is there going to be a recording available? And the answer is yes, there will be a recording available. So you'll be able to see this again if you get called away during the meeting or if you have colleagues you'd like to share this with, friends, family, anybody in the world uh, that you think would be find this information valuable, it will be available online. You will be receiving a link after the meeting is over. So yes, there will be a recording. Number two, um, as the agenda shows there, there will be a Q&A section. And that's, of course, probably the most fun part of this meeting. And so that'll be available uh, toward the end as usual. Um, and if you like, you can experiment with that functionality right now. Just so, just for fun, if you'd like, send a, you can send us a little heads up and say hi and from wherever you are from or wherever you are right now. So you can, if, just to get familiar with the Q&A feature, a lot of times people are kind of afraid to um, uh, send a question. So you can experiment right now and just said, hey, I'm from Columbus, Ohio or wherever you're from. Um, anyway, so that's coming, but uh, before we get to the Q&A, the Kate, we're going to start off again with MindPath's uh, Care Center's case study. And uh, I think you're going to find that super, whoops, back back. <laughs> I'm not there yet. Um, so we're going to start right there. Um, then we're going to go talk about no-shows, which um, no-shows are a problem in every specialty um, and profession, but in behavioral health, they seem to be even harder. And there's some reasons for that. We'll discuss why that's a problem and then um, ways to solve that. Um, how to reduce some of those shows, which is, a, again, a very common problem, um, a revenue killer, frustrating and, um, you know, schedule busting problem. And then there's also, uh, we're going to cover strategies because that's not, this is a lot more than just reducing those shows. There's a bunch of strategies we can use to increase your patient volume, grow revenue, operate more efficiently. And so JD will be talking about those things as we um, go through the end. So let's go ahead now, switch over to the case study. So again, with uh, MindPath uh, and uh, uh, Diego Garza, go ahead, next slide. Diego, uh, take it away. Awesome, thank you everyone. So I guess I'm gonna get started by giving you a little bit of my background and how I'm related to the telemedicine industry. So I'm a primary care physician by training and a master in public health from the University of North Carolina. And I've been operating in the uh, space of applied technology in the intersection between applied technology and healthcare delivery with the idea of increasing access to healthcare services. I've been working on the telemedicine arena for more than 11 years now. So uh, this is 
I have plenty of experience developing and implementing telemedicine programs around the nation and in different countries, actually. So uh, to give you more background on MindPath Care Centers, so MindPath Care Centers is the largest outpatient behavioral health practice in the state of North Carolina. Uh, we have uh, around more than 25 locations and we have more than 200 clinicians actively uh, seeing patients for the practice. Um, and uh, a little bit on, of history on the, on why MindPath started on this uh, pathway of uh, telemedicine. So we started very early into this, into this game. It was 2015 when we decided that telemedicine was an avenue to increase access to care. And we started working on that uh, uh, since 2015. I joined MindPath in 2017 to develop and implement or grow their telepsychiatry teletherapy program. At that point in time, that same year, we started a partnership with uh, MEND Telemedicine to help us navigate uh, the growth of the company. So what, what we were after many things, honestly, but uh, you can see some of them on the slide deck. And so we're trying to grow our, our telehealth offering. As I said, we decided pretty early on that this is an avenue to increase access to care. And we had this idea that we, if we were able to do it with enough quality, we will be able to reach more and more patients throughout the state of North Carolina. So it's not only about growth, but about doing efficiently and effectively. And that the partnership that we have created with mental medicine has really helping, uh, helped us take that to the next level. So we were trying to figure out what to do with the expensive no-shows that uh, Stuart started discussing earlier. Um, it wasn't a huge problem for MindPath because we've been engaged in a lot of no-show reduction initiatives for a very long time, but we still needed that extra push to get us to from where we were to where we are right now. And we'll discuss that in a bit. Uh, we are a company that are, we are in growth mode, right? So we started in North Carolina. We now have presence in six states. Uh, we just recently uh, uh, are going through uh, mergers last, slash acquisition with community psychiatry, a, a, a behavioral health private practice based off California. So all of a sudden we went from having 200 clinicians to having 400 clinicians. And we really needed a partnership that helped us navigate the national landscape of, of telemedicine. And we're going to keep growing. We're going to keep, keep having more offices and more providers. So it, it was important for us to find a partner that, that will walk with us through, through that process. Um, we have plenty of experience with different, uh, different platforms. So I encourage all of you to really define the process of how, how to select a platform. We, after an extensive study period, we decided that MEN was the best option back in 2017. And I think we can uh, say uh, confidently now that that was probably the best decision we've made in a long time. So uh, it's, been, it's been a great experience. And ultimately what we're trying to do, what we're working towards doing is becoming a national leader in telemedicine. And I think, uh, as you can see on the top right corner of the slide, we have the URAC accreditation uh, seal. And we're the first outpatient behavioral health practice to hold the national telemedicine accreditation by URAC. And that puts us at the level of the main players in uh, the national telemedicine environment. So we're really committed to quality and growth and just figuring out ways of how to better serve our patient population. Excellent. Hey, Diego. Yeah. Uh, just a quick question here or, or comment, I guess. Um, one of the things that, you know, we work with uh, lots of multi-location providers around the country, and this is a real issue of just scaling. And I think that this is something that, do you guys have the mindset? Because this is pretty ambitious what you guys are doing. Is that, uh, this is technology, but is that a mindset throughout your uh, business? And is, did you guys see technology as part of that? Because to do what you guys are doing is, uh, yeah. we're going to talk more about this, but the scaling part is really critical. Yeah, I, 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 I appreciate that question. And to the short answer is that we define ourselves as a, as a tech-enabled company whatever that technology might be, but we need to have the technology that allows us to grow. In reality, if we want to become, if we are becoming a national player with presence right now in six states and many more states to come, we need to have the technology that supports that growth. So uh, to answer your question, Stuart, yes, technology is probably the biggest uh, item on that list of things to consider when you're thinking about scalability. Uh, and it's important to do that hand-in-hand -hand with clinical quality and operational uh, procedures. So 
uh, yeah, technology enables all of those processes. Definitely. Yeah. It's a mindset. Let's go ahead and do the next slide. So to keep talking a little bit more about the story, history here between MindPath and MEND, we started back in 2017 with a, with a 10 provider uh, pilot seeing 30 patients per month. I was the director of telemedicine back then. Very small program, very small uh, reach. Uh, we're, now see, we're now up to yesterday that we counted last time, 211 providers uh, participating in the telemedicine offering. And uh, we pursued integration between our electronic health record and um, meant the telemedicine platform that we that we use. So it's it has really grown a lot over the past few years, and it's been a great experience just being able to say, okay, we we always approach telemedicine as a different delivery method for the same quality slash same type of services that you deliver in the offices. As much as that as, as that statement can hold true throughout different specialties, but uh, it is uh, the idea is quality goes first and then you, you take quality and you define patient experience, provider experience, administrative experience, and all of those things really need to align for your product to be really, really well established. Uh, so in, these are some of the examples of things that we do to make sure the patient, provider, and administrative experience is, is, is the best possible one. So we have uh, developed with, MEN has developed for all self-scheduling that allows patients to request appointments based on different factors that have some sort of algorithm that matches them with the right provider. We uh, can assign patients different statuses based on the integration. So I can see when a patient is inactive in the system, for example, I can see what their insurance is. It automatically triggers different, different electronic forms that allow us to get information from the telemedicine platform directly into the patient's chart. And that's uh, something that allows, uh, that, that plays right into that mindset of, sustainability and scalability, Stuart, uh, that you just mentioned, that everything you do needs to be patient-centered, but with the idea of like, this is gonna work here, how do I make it work on a, on a big scale, right? So um, any questions or comments on this one? Yeah, I just think that the, well, the, the scale is, again, everything. And the one thing that, the words that just pop up to me there, Diego, are self-scheduling, and so, uh, we talked offline a little bit about this and people that have, uh, are on our listen to me on other webinars and podcasts will recognize that one of the things that I always think ironic is patients, if you ask them, what are the things they really want to do with their provider online and electronically, and they'll typically say things like be able to communicate, you know, with my provider in a secure way and let me self schedule and what are the two things that uh, so many providers don't want to let them do let them, you know, take their time with questions online and um, self-schedule. So we recognize that can be complicated and there's a lot of issues there, but just from a patient-friendly standpoint, um, the demand is overwhelming. And I'm sure you probably see that too, Diego. Yeah, we do. And, and honestly, as you were saying, that's, that's our thought process. Uh, what do patients want? What do patients need? And that's what we should be aiming to get on top of making sure that we're delivering uh, the best, possible uh, clinical services, because that's in the end, that's the product that we deliver to our patients. It's very so impressive. Enable that is, is, is the question. And yeah, and what you guys are doing is super impressive. Absolutely. Thank you. Can we move to the next slide uh, just to keep things moving? Um, so this is just a set of, uh, to further the example that we've been talking about from the MindPath experience. Uh, we were able to reduce no-show rate from 13% to 6% which it's a huge lift and it comes with a lot of um, different technology pieces that we, we've been working with men to really ensure that we're keeping the no-show uh, uh, at, at, at rest as much as we can. And also plays right into the health outcomes of the patient population, right? If you have a patient that you're keeping engaged and you're able to see them as often as they should be seen for whatever clinical diagnosis they might have, those patients are gonna be better and are gonna get better faster and sooner so it is, it is important for us to make sure that patients are engaged. I was telling the, the team uh, the other day that when I talk about, tele, about men as a platform, I do not define men as a telemedicine platform only. It's a telemedicine platform and a patient engagement platform. And the patient engagement platform is as important as having the video capabilities to connect with the patients because uh, you need a patient on the other side of the spectrum to be able to deliver services, right? So you need to keep them engaged and make them feel like it's easy enough to connect. Uh, which plays right into another comment that I made, uh, which is when telehealth started as, as a concept back in the day, uh, 
it was mostly about access, right? Increasing access to care. And we have transitioned that mindset mostly because of the pandemic and how uh, it basically kicked us 10 years into the future to not only access, but ease of access, right? How easy can I make it for my patients to connect? Because it's not talking about vulnerable populations anymore only. We, we still talk to them and we still serve them, obviously, as much as we can. But everyone has access to telemedicine. So the question is, who makes it easier for the patient? And that's the one they're going to go for, right? So over the, the years, we have, this, we have fully enabled telemedicine clinical capabilities across the spectrum of services. So any single line uh, of service that we have, we have enabled as much as we can of telemedicine capabilities. A good example of that is the Addiction Recovery Center that used to be based out of a, uh, an office in Raleigh, North Carolina. And all of a sudden, we are able to provide that program, which includes one-on-one -on -one medication, one-on-one -on -one therapy, and group therapy sessions for a, a long period of time. Uh, that program is now statewide, and it allows us to really uh, reach more patients that are in need of these services. And, and, and thinking about it, North Carolina is a highly rural state, so we're really making a dent on, on the access piece and, and, and keep working with men very closely on access and ease of access. So as it's stated in the uh, slide, we increased transaction totals by 73%, which, I mean, that's great, but really what we're talking about here is we were able to see many more patients. The highest volume of completed visits in the history of the company were accomplished, uh, was accomplished during the pandemic. And that's just impressive. And it's because of the partnership that we had with men and the fact that we were uh, able to just grow. Uh, you can see on the right side of the screen that the total visits from 14,000 to 165,000 visits from 78 providers to 187 to 2000 uh, to 211 now in, in the North Carolina, South Carolina market, plus the ones that just joined from the California piece. And then we have the geographical reach, which plays into the asset access and ease of access. In 2019, we were able to reach 84 out of the 100 counties in North Carolina, which if you ask me, that was pretty impressive. And that's the type of reach you can only get with an online program. But in 2020, we did even better. And we reached patients in 98 out of the 100 counties in the state, which is something that people cannot do um, cannot do without online presence because otherwise you will have to have an office in every county to make that happen. And we all know that's basically impossible. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it over. Stuart, I don't know if you have any other questions or comments. No, I think uh, you're good. I, I think this is a terrific presentation, Diego. Thank you. I was, um, again, he'll, uh, uh, Dr. Garz will be available for questions as well after when we get to the Q&A. But Diego, I'm inspired. You guys are a great case study and you just embrace this um, uh, the timing was perfect, right? With the whole COVID transition and, um, and your growth. So good job. We'll uh, talk to you again in a few minutes. Thank you. Um, so as we transition to the next slide. Um, so the no-show problem, we broke this down because we just, uh, as we prepped for this and talked and uh, thought about how to do the agenda, one of the things that came up for a lot of men's uh, providers is no show. So we thought we'd start with the big one, start with the, rip the bandaid off of the worst problem. So I've seen um, data on this um, that, you know, uh, all across the board from a low of 22% to a high of 37% for behavioral health practice no show rates. Uh, but at any rate, we know that it's a high and we know that it's really one of the highest no show rates in healthcare. So for to talk a little bit about that problem, because certainly knows more about this than I do. JD, tell us on the next slide here and walk us, start walking us through about this problem. And maybe the first place to start is why? Why is this such a problem in behavioral health? Sure. And so everyone has a little bit more background on me. I come from the behavioral health IT realm. I spent most of my career working there, uh, past seven of which was as an IT director for a community mental health center. So we saw these problems all the time, and I just got to throw it out. If we had ever seen a 6% no-show rate, all the executives in my company, their jaws would have been on the floor. So kudos um, to Dr. Garza and MindPath. That's an amazing achievement. Um, we routinely saw 50% no-shows for a lot of our programs. And the problems are, in many cases, just common sense and it it's just the realities of who you're treating. Um, 
my experience is primarily with low income, but across the board, the people who you're treating are dealing with very difficult situations in their lives. They've probably got financial strains and stresses they're dealing with. And something as simple as getting to the doctor's appointment is not a simple task, uh, particularly in rural areas. We serve a lot of Indian reservations. And if someone has to come on site for one of their appointments, it can be a day long ordeal. Multiple hour drive each way, they've got to take an entire day off work. They might have to pay for a babysitter. You're talking about a huge financial outlay just for gas potentially by itself. Don't even take lost work time into it. Then you start thinking about people. They might actually be court ordered to services, but they might also be court ordered to maintain constant employment. How many employers are gonna be happy if you're taking out two, three days a week for individual therapy sessions right in the middle of the day? You have to find a way to accommodate that. And especially once again, if you've got to drive multiple hours for that therapy session, it's impossible now to maintain a job. So whatever you can do to bridge those barriers is a huge, huge um, improvement. So simple things like forgotten appointments. Well, as we mentioned earlier, let the clients schedule their own appointments. Let the clients schedule the appointments a lot closer to the time of their service. In a lot of healthcare, we like to schedule their appointment when we're checking them out. So for a psychiatric follow-up, we might schedule them three months out. I don't know what I'm doing in three months. People ask me, is 3 p.m. on a Thursday, three months from now, good for you? I just said, oh, maybe. Hopefully, we'll see what happens. Uh, so I schedule it, it gets on the book, and then hopefully I won't be canceling it. Well, with technology, we can automatically send them an invitation to schedule their follow-up two weeks before that three-month appointment. Now they know what's on their schedule, they're going to be much more likely to actually attend that session. So just some of the things we can do um, with technology to start remediating these solutions. And of course, telehealth itself, as we're talking about travel distance, being able to go to where the patients are in their living room, do therapy on their couch, they're comfortable. Most everybody has internet that we can maintain a connection on. Um, the men platform can actually maintain a connection all the way down to a 2G connection. Um, and if video drops out, we can maintain audio. So lots of opportunity there for people to be seen. And then you can start looking at strategies like partnering with local churches, um, community health centers, and actually putting kiosks and remote office locations that can be unmanned and utilize technology so people don't have to travel across town to get to your appointments. Excellent. And, and JD, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but have you found as well the uh, that last bullet corner there about extended lead times where it takes a long time to get uh, scheduled? Has that been a, a big issue for you when you were uh, in that world as a provider with the provider world? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, with state funded mental health, there's almost always a waiting list and there's almost never enough providers to go around. So the sad truth is there's not enough providers, but you got a 50% show no show rate. Well, you got a lot of time you can fit people in, but if you don't have a good mechanism to do it, you can't do it. So you have wasted capacity and you're further underserving the community that's already underserved. So just giving them something like an on-demand queue that's available online where they can go from a couple clicks and just wait for the next available provider because there will be a provider who has a no-show in a couple minutes, let them be seen versus making them wait on a waiting list for an appointment that might not be for a couple months. Huge impact, um, both financially, but also you're having a positive impact in the community because you're getting people help. Outstanding. All right, next slide, please. Judy? Yes. Um, so we have great tools available to us right now. Um, this is the new dawn of the AI era. And our company has built our own AI no-show prediction tool. And it tracks over 88 different variables um, of data. And they're tracking things like what we're showing on the screen, no-show rates, time of day, cost, um, type of insurance, but they're also tracking, did they actually look at the appointment reminder? Did they log in? Did they complete the forms that are necessary for this visit? Patients who are engaged are much, much more likely to show. But 
the greatest predictor of no-show, which is next slide, no surprise for everybody, is have they previously no-showed. So being able to analyze your client base, know very quickly who are your at-risk clients, then you can start taking steps to mitigate that risk. You can apply automatically with our software additional follow-ups, additional notifications. You can even have a white glove reach out, have a human call them a day before and say, hey, we really want you to show up. You think you're going to make it. Let the patient confirm that they're actually going to attend the day of, day before, and let them reschedule right from within the text message with a couple clicks. And if they need to reschedule, let's go ahead and let's pull the provider's availability out of the EHR and let them reschedule in a realistic time that works for both the provider and the patient. Excellent. Next slide, please. Next slide. All right. So best practices. We've talked about it a couple times. One of the big key themes throughout this presentation is make things easy for the client. So patient self-scheduling makes it easy. Appointment reminders that are going over multiple channels. Email, text message, voice messages. Go to where the clients are. If they don't have a smartphone, if they're an elderly person who has vision problems, maybe text messages aren't going to work for them. Being able to send an actual voice, automated voicemail message to say, hey, this is your appointment time, either give them an in-person reminder or give them a reminder of how to get into the telehealth system and access their visit. Reducing appointment lead times, we've already mentioned. Shortening that time to scheduling, that's going to result in more clients seen, lower no-show rates. Adopt a telehealth platform that integrates patient communications with your EHR. Integration is what separates the teleconferencing solutions from the tools that can actually really make your life easier. Instead of just having a different way to look at the patient, is your patient engagement platform actually making your life easier? It doesn't matter if it can do a lot of things, if it requires someone to manually click buttons to make that happen every time. Through automation, we can do things like automatically assign forms based on appointment type. We can trigger subsequent forms based on the answer of the first round of forms. We can put those forms back in the EHR automatically. We can allow patient self-scheduling against real provider schedules with real provider availability. And we can build a scheduling triage around the rules and logic that your business has so that you don't have to let them schedule for inappropriate visit types with inappropriate providers during hours you're not open. All right. Uh, one thing I just want to jump in before we switch to the next slide, JD, is that word easy you mentioned at the very beginning. Uh, that um, is such a powerful factor, just as a, an aside from all the work that we do and uh, many of the people, that, if you're from, if you know, um, if you're on the, uh, from my blog readership, uh, I talk about this a lot in some of our podcasts is the whole idea of easy. In fact, I'm even thinking about writing my next book about the power of easy. If you just think about, uh, in my experience, doing marketing, seeing what motivates people, because that's what got me into marketing in the first place was fascination with why people behave the way they do and how can you ethically influence them. Um, if they're making it just a little tiny easier is all the difference in the world. It's all the difference in the world. Um, so if you think about it, when was the last time you went up to your TV and manually adjusted the um, channel? Probably never, because you probably don't know how to, because you don't care, because you know have remote control. Uh, if you remember back in the old days with VCRs, you used to blink 12 forever, and finally they, um, they started coming out with pay $20 more and it'll automatically set the time, and people paid it. People want easy. And so I just would stress that with, and with this topic or anything else you're trying to do when it comes to consumers, make their life easy. Next slide, please. Next slide. All right, so how do you, how do you expand revenue um, with technology? First off, expand your geographic reach. With telehealth, you no longer have a limitation of I am only limited to the patients in my neighborhood, in my city. Most of you are going to be limited by your state. You're going to have the ability to see clients from 
top to bottom as long as your providers are registered within that state. That means you can recruit providers who live out of the area, but you can also advertise to clients throughout the state. So you're solving transportation barriers, but you're also opening up a whole new potential client population. Think of the bookseller in New York who realized he could start selling things online in 1995 and called it Amazon. That's the kind of paradigm shift we're looking at. There's no more reason to limit yourself to just the people in your neighborhood. Next okay. slide. Expand hours, same kind of deal. We all know how busy life is. Most of us work something around eight to five. Even before telehealth, practices were already starting to extend hours. Things like family therapy, if you have to take off work, you have to take your child out of school, the number of hours that are available for that is really, really small. And the amount of time that you're going to lose and potentially hurt your child's education and take money out of your pocketbook is huge. But if you can extend hours just a few, maybe seven, eight o'clock at night, now you have a whole lot more time available to serve customers. If you only work from nine to five, you're closed 80% of the time. So with telehealth, once again, the providers don't have to be in the office. They don't even have to be working for you full time. They can be contract and just work a few hours a day and say, I want to work Thursdays and Fridays, five to eight. Now you've got a block of scheduling time available. You can go after clients who work. You know you're going to get paid. They have insurance or their self-pay. You've just opened up a whole nother opportunity. So once again, Think bigger, think outside of the constraints that you had before the technology was there. Outstanding. All right, reduce lead times. We've talked about this um, before. Studies have shown that if you've got to wait 13 days um, to see an appointment or for an appointment, you're gonna have about a 52% no-show in certain uh, practices. If you can get that down to same day, you're gonna get radically reduced no-show rates. It's just common sense. Humans typically want to deliver on the things they say they're going to do. If I say I am going to be somewhere at noon, unless something crazy happens, I'm going to be there at noon. It's a lot harder for me to say I'm going to be there at noon three months from now than it is tomorrow. I'm still going to try and be there three months from now, but I'm really forgetful. And I'm probably not going to remember. So anything you can do to let clients schedule sooner or schedule closer to the time of their appointment, they're going to be happier. Anything you can do to reduce wait time for an appointment, that's going to benefit both you and the client. Next slide. All of the technologies, all of the options that telehealth can provide We've talked about self-scheduling and rescheduling. This is a scary thing for a lot of practices. Um, like Stuart said, we talked about it offline. On the sales side, 50% of clients or prospects come in and say, we got to have client self-scheduling. And the other half say, we absolutely do not want it. When we dig into why they don't want it, there's good reasons they don't want it. Your technology vendor has to be agile enough to adapt and conform your or their technology to your workflow. So for example, some of the reasons providers don't want patient self-scheduling is they don't want them scheduling inappropriate appointment types within appropriate providers in the wrong hours. We like to say, you know, it should be as simple as making a table reservation um, on open table. Well, open table is not gonna have to check your insurance, figure out if, um, you're appropriate to sit at a table um, with three chairs versus four chairs. And there, there, there's way more variables, but the technology exists. We can accommodate for those variables and we can make sure that your client gets to an appropriate appointment. We can even filter them out and say, this is not appropriate for self-scheduling. Please call your provider at this number to schedule um, or liability. You're concerned that they're gonna call while they're in cardiac arrest. We can let them know this is an inappropriate type, call 911. So the tools are there. Group therapy, people don't often think about telehealth for group therapy. We have very large national providers who completely switched to telehealth during COVID and haven't gone back. 
One of them is doing um, over 20,000 group visits per month, and they are providing um, IOP, intensive outpatient substance abuse services. So these are three hour long sessions, multiple times a week with up to 20 people in the group at a time. And they're a hybrid between on-site and remote. Think about the impact of that. So group visits are already some of your most profitable appointments. The more people you can have, once you have the staffing ratios right, it, you're just adding revenue onto an existing cost, which is the providers. You can add more people on up to certain limits through the video. You can also make sure that those clients are gonna have better outcomes because they're gonna be able to attend more sessions. They don't have to do them all on video. They can do a hybrid, sometimes in person, sometimes on video. But when you're dealing with three hour long appointments multiple times a week, think about how hard that is for someone to maintain a job. Anything we can do to make that more flexible is gonna be able to bring them in and make them more successful. So one thing we have alluded to, we haven't talked about a lot about is improve your payer mix. With the geographic options, you now have the ability to go statewide that also means you might be able to target a whole different class of customer than you used to. Like I said, I came from the community mental health world. We did not have self-pay clients coming into the office. They didn't want to be associated with um, public health. They, frankly, our offices were not nearly as nice as the private practice offices that they could go to across the street. With telehealth, you can have the same excellent providers seeing state-funded clients, in their living room and seeing self-funded clients in their living room. And payers like Medicaid, which usually pay better than a lot of this, which pays better than most of the state payer contracts, have very minimal uh, regulatory hurdles for telehealth now. And if you're something like a community mental health center, you can keep your core business, you can keep your state and federal grants, and you can go after these Medicaid and self-pay clients your providers can work from home if necessary. Everybody has a better experience. And now you've got a whole new revenue stream you didn't have before. And any of you who are used to working with state contracts, everybody says we want to get away from it. We want to diversify it because they are very painful contracts to maintain and you can never really count on them forever. And okay. I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I, I, go ahead. I was just going to say, I'm double checking to make sure there's nothing I've forgotten because there's a lot on this slide. <laughs> I, can, I can make a couple comments for you. Yeah. Um, and so the, um, again, I, as, uh, for those of you who don't know, and I didn't introduce myself very well, I'm CEO of Healthcare Success, which is a marketing agency. And so because of a lot of the things we've done, we get phone calls every day. Um, from providers, um, you know, multi-location businesses looking for solutions on the marketing side. And there's some areas where that marketing and telemarketing or telehealth um, overlap, which is why this topic intrigues me so much. Because in the world of marketing, people think about just the promotional side, but really the secret to good marketing is having a better product, uh, if you think about that. And that's really what's exciting to me about telehealth. Um, and these kind of integrated platforms. Remember, I talked about easiness. We were going to talk about patient experience. We've talked about um, multifacets. But at the end of the day, if you're looking at this world from a marketing point of view, um, what you're doing is you're finding a way to build a better mousetrap. And so I think some of the things that I would just expand upon would be um, the idea of offering, you know, a telehealth option, a print person option, the hybrid option, I think is exciting. And when we get to q and I'd love to hear either from the panelists or from uh, the or our uh, attendees, if you have questions about that, we can drill down in whatever area you like. But I think building a product correctly and then make going back to easy, which I referred to a little while ago. One thing that hasn't come up that I think is also really uh, important as we uh, swing into the home stretch here. By the way, we're going to be doing Q and A in just a couple minutes. Um, is the whole provider side? In other words, uh, number the third from the bottom uh, bullet there, I think, is really really important. Is that um, today many providers expect to work from home? And again, going back to the why do I know that? You know, in a marketing agency. Well, we work. Um, many of the phone calls we get right now, uh, behavioral health. Um, historically hasn't been super 
um, or in the old days, I guess, wasn't certainly was an aggressive marketing niche compared to some other niches. But today, there's a lot of providers out there now that are thinking about these same kinds of issues. So we've talked about the public health side a lot today, but the private pay, uh, which is a very different audience, uh, but coincidentally has the same kinds of needs. So instead of you know serving the underserved and the poor of the community and the people with uh, longstanding you know um, dual diagnoses and so forth, you may have you know people targeting upscale professionals. You know the quintessential female forty to sixty or whomever, and they also have um, expectations of what they can do. And we start thinking about how do we build a product they want to buy, right? And we also see that these businesses, whether they're public health or private pay, are um, looking to expand. And so there's certainly a, will continue to be single practitioner practices, but there's a lot now that are looking at, okay, how do we scale? How do we grow? How do we adapt to our new century? Uh, how do we want to be one of the surviving groups? Uh, and so this is a really kind of key function to this. So if we think about, okay, we're building the right scaling, we're building the right uh, mix of products and then you know the geography and um, you know the operational stuff all this stuff fits together so it's been a um, we've had some really terrific discussions today but just keep in mind that I feel like whether you're looking at this from a public health side or you're uh, looking at it from private pay and again I'm just going back to another comment I made a moment ago which is the uh, providers expecting to work from home I see that with both um, some of the clinics we hear calling and, and the, um, the businesses we speak with, you know, it's like, and, and I would say of all of them, due to its nature, the providers, um, you know, the therapists themselves just, you know, kind of are in the catbird seat. They want to work from home. They've gotten used to it and they expect it. So uh, before we switch on uh, anything else, any other comments on that, JD, because I think that's important. No, uh, you're absolutely right. We've literally had calls with prospects saying that they are having problems hiring providers because they can't provide a good telehealth solution. Even before COVID, there was a nationwide shortage of psych certified ARNPs and psychiatrists. Now they can be even more picky. They can appeal to an entire, once again, statewide audience, just like you can market statewide, they can market themselves statewide. And, and in fact, if they're registered in your state, they don't even have to live there most of the time. So it is very much a um, employee's market and being able to offer good um, benefits to your customers or good benefits to your employees, just like your customers is gonna make sure you can attract the best, keep the best and um, have a really great experience for everybody. Outstanding. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, and JD, just start, I, we talked about this, but any, do you want to exclamate or make a statement on that one? Yeah, I alluded to it already. Um, if you don't have automation, you're just making a lot of, of hard work for yourself. Um, if if your, your, if your platform doesn't integrate with your EHR, if it doesn't give you tools to move data automatically between systems, someone's got to do that manually. Those people have a price tag attached to them. You may be able to use them more efficiently elsewhere in your organization. Um, one real life experience, one of our customers during COVID, they switched completely to telehealth. They also lost half of their front desk staff. Um, basically, the enhanced unemployment was way more than they were getting paid by the company. And they said, we're out of here. We're not coming back. This all happened simultaneously. And over the course of three weeks, everything converted to telehealth. What they found out is being able to automatically assign forms, get those forms back, get consents signed, collect payment. They didn't need that 50% front desk staff that they lost. They were able to continue for all of 2019, 2020, until today at the same staffing levels that basically they, they were forced to adopt for COVID. And they didn't rehire those people, but in many organizations, those people can be reallocated to do things like marketing, compliance, make sure that clients are getting better care. It's a huge, huge win in a world where no one's rushing to pay you more money. All right, perfect. JD, a last slide. Or, um... JD, you've got a 30 second message. We're going to do <laughs> we're, so that, we're, this is a call for questions and answers. We've got some questions coming into us now. 
uh, but this is your big chance. So JD, while we're waiting for people to, as they start hopefully typing away at, uh, with a bunch of good questions for us, can you uh, just give us a 30 second, 60 second message about MIM? Sure. We are your complete patient engagement platform. Like Dr. Garza mentioned, telehealth is just one tool, but frankly, there's tons of teleconferencing tools. But do those tools make your life easier? If they don't include appointment reminders, if they can't capture payment, if you can't get forms signed, if you can't get consents signed, can you actually treat these clients? We don't want to have to fax clients a, a packet and wait for them to fax it back. Can you send on-demand ad hoc messages to your clients within a couple clicks saying, hey, I'm running behind and, or I need to reschedule or hey, our entire location is going to be closed due, due to a snow, uh, snowstorm. Um, do you have a partner who can handle patient self-scheduling with the complexity that your practice demands in order to open up that whole new level of um, automation and efficiency? We can do that. We'd love to talk to you. Um, hope, hopefully I'll be hearing from you soon. Very good. Okay, so for Q&A, and the very first question I'd like to ask, um, really Diego or um, JD, um, just and uh, sort of briefly, because we want to get a bunch of questions answered here, but the, the nature of therapy is so personal, so relationship driven. For those um, businesses who haven't really embraced it yet, there may be a fear that this, the patient experience just will be subpar. It won't be as good as in person. And the, the whole, you know, um, the, the relationship between the therapist and the um, uh, patient will be so difficult. Um, do either of you guys have a comment on that? Uh, JD, I'll take this one if you want. Um, so I think there, there is, or there has been this fear or idea that the services delivered via telemedicine are not as good as the services delivered in office, but I think there's plenty of research now that shows that the outcomes, specifically in the behavioral health arena, are better, the outcomes, meaning health outcomes for the patient population, are actually better through telemedicine than what they are in person. And I think that uh, technology, although a big part of it, is not all of the answer to that question. It's having appropriate training, training your providers, training your clinicians to be able to relate, to relate to their patients in a different way that the the relationship between telemedicine and in office is different in nature, but it could be as good as the one that you have in person if you're able to control for the environment, control for the types of services. And obviously, as long as you're practicing uh, through evidence-based uh, programs or, or strategies or approaches, then you should be good and should be able to connect with your patient appropriately. Excellent, Diego. And then JD, when we talked about this just offline, you were mentioning about the patient feeling warm and cozy at home. Do you wanna expand upon that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, unfortunately, most, especially not-for-profit mental health facilities, there's only so much money. They can only make the places so inviting. Clients are comfortable on their couch. That's where we spend most of the time. Being able to just open up their laptop or use their cell phone, curl up in their, their blanket that they curl up in on the couch every night and talk to their therapist that's gonna give them a level of comfort that they're, they're not always gonna be able to get in the office. And we saw that the fears of patient satisfaction from uh, telehealth, the patient satisfaction for telehealth was higher than it was for in-person visits. And there's lots of factors that go into that. But you know, I think at the end of the day, if you've got good providers who are able to learn the technology, adapt to the technology, and most importantly, maintain that connection with the patient, you're not going to have any problems. Outstanding. Uh, keep the questions coming. That's another one here from Janice. Uh, Janice uh, asks, uh, does men have a document signing capability integrated into an appointment so that consumer can... Uh, sign and provide ID documentation, et cetera, during their appointments without having to mail, email, fax, et cetera. Absolutely. Um, that is one of my favorite features. Um, coming from an operational world, being able to shovel paperwork around this process is very time consuming and very costly. Uh, with men, we're 100% e-sign compliant. We can capture digital signatures, but we can also capture full um, 
full client forms, we optimize them so that they are easily um, utilized on mobile devices because over 86% of clients access these things on mobile devices. We have conditional logic. We can do external lookups to things like medications databases, pharmacy databases, so they can pull in the exact address of their Walgreens. We can get all that data back to you. And by the way, over 80% of our forms are filled out before the appointment. 50% are filled out within an hour of them being requested. And that just speaks to how easy we make it for patients to do this. And that's as opposed to something like a patient portal that has maybe a 30% utilization rate. All right, very good. Another question was, uh, we haven't talked as much about uh, psychiatrists, prescribers. Uh, give us input on how this works within their world. I, I believe that opened to JD or uh, Diego. Yeah, I, I can give you some input on that. So uh, I think in the in the prescribing arena, it is, it. it the integration capability of the platform that you select becomes very, very important as you need to be able to see a lot of the information reflected in the electronic health record in the actual patient's chart. So I think for the prescribers, to give you an example, MindPath is heavy on prescribers. Out of the 211, more than 100 are, are medication management providers. So uh, it, it has been a, a tool that it's easy to use and easy to navigate. And with what JD was just explaining, the ability that we have to send control substance contracts to the platform, the ability that we have to really interact with the assessments and, and forms, electronic forms that we're sending out to the patients in real time during the session, it makes the experience for the provider very easy to navigate and it allows them to provide the best possible care. Very, very, very good. Um, another question that's related similarly is, uh, I did mention about how different private pay is versus the public health world. Uh, which of you guys or both would like to cover, you know, the private pay marketplace? How is that different? Um, what, how does that contrast? Um, and especially if, you know, I have a private pay, which again, in my world, you know, for example, we see a lot of those private pay looking to go after, um, you know, the completely different sort of uh, insurance and type of patient. Tell us about how this applies there. Uh, I think that number one for private pay is simplicity. You already mentioned easy. Your private pay clients are the ones with the most options. They're, they're not going to be limited by who their insur insurance provider allows them to go to. They're not going to be limited by who the state's going to pay for. They can go anywhere they want. So they have to have as low a barrier to entry as possible. Whatever paperwork you're going to make them do, it needs to be easy. It needs to be quick. And they want to be able to schedule, they want to be able to have control over their experience. And then most importantly, they want to have a really good experience. Dr. Garza, what do you think? Yeah, I think that's right, JD. And I also think that um, it is, I mean, depends on the state of where you're located, how easy or how hard it's going to be to navigate the payer side of the spectrum, honestly. But, uh, but yeah, I think more and more private insurance, private payers are coming on board with the idea of telemedicine should not only be paid for, but should be paid for at parity, meaning that it's paid at the same level as an in-office appointment. So I think with the pandemic, that has that, that's one of the things that uh, that push forward in the telemedicine arena, uh, achieving payment parity. And uh, I think it's gonna be an easier landscape moving forward for all of us. So, and I'll add from my standpoint, a couple of things, because I've worked with both. Um, the private pay, you know, one of the things that I talk about a lot in different forms is about healthcare consumerism. And today patients are no longer patients, they're healthcare consumers. And that's especially true on the private pay side. Um, patients are, like I said, they are no longer approaching. And this is changing at light speed, you guys. I've been doing this a long time. And what's happened over the last three or four years in terms of consumer expectations has just exploded on the scene. So if you're in the private pay world, just recognize, first of all, that they want it their way. They want it now. <laughs> they expect it now. They're, everybody else, the, the mindset has gone from, um, you know, you're on top of this mountain and, you know, can I get a few minutes of air to spend some time with you to like, you work for me, how can you help me? <laughs> and so it, the idea about being easy, about being convenient, how do I pay for this? Um, there are people that are willing to pay cash for therapy. I do um, for myself and my family at times. The, it's a different marketplace. And there's also super competition, as you know. Uh, there's some national um, uh, telehealth, not just like um, uh, 
uh, softwares, but the actual providers, clinics uh, out there that are marketing aggressively, you know which ones those are. They're experimenting with low price point um, entry for on a cash basis and um, uh, doing well. I'm finding that what's interesting is some of the private pay practices I've worked with in the past uh, and I'm working with now, um, they find they are the second provider. They wanted something more than they were able to find through one of those big chains. And so, um, and what's interesting also is I've seen some uh, that did a, that were really kind of a mix and that always was difficult. Just like JD mentioned, if somebody's used to doing public health, their offices don't really feel like when you start mixing private pay and public health patients, then sometimes they don't feel like they're in the right place. And so the uh, telehealth takes that option or that barrier away. It's all virtual. So that's a big, long conversation. But I would just say from my standpoint, if you're in, uh, in that world, I would be thinking about the consumer expects it their way. <laughs> so it's not just, it's, it's partly, it's all the stuff we just discussed, but it's also a competitive advantage that I think would be absolutely crucial. Um, the, um, okay, next question. Um, uh, let's see, there's a bunch here. We'll just do these sort of rapid fire. Um, Dr. Garza, how do you build staff buy-in? Um, getting them to believe in the mission of whatever you're trying to accomplish. I think that's the easiest way to do it. And creating processes and workflows that really play well with the day-to-day -day operations. Excellent. Um, rapid fire again here. JD, which EHRs does Mend integrate with? Almost all of them. Um, we have over 88 that we have integrated with, and we have technology that can integrate with most any of them. Outstanding. Uh, for Dr. Garza, there was a question about do, have your systems and workflows been successful from uh, managing both telehealth and in-person care? Yeah, uh, they have been. We have a successful hybrid model. We do uh, in-office in office in telemedicine and telemedicine only. So yeah, they have been able to support the different models. Outstanding. How long does implementation take? Uh, short answer is that depends. Long answer is that really depends. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we have stood up our software in as little as a week for a 3000 provider um, hospital system. And we have some implementations where because of limitations waiting on the EHR, they've been going on for a year. So um, it's something that has to get assessed by case by case basis, general rule of thumb, figure 60 days. Got it. Um, one person asked what makes men different from just, you know, simply working with Zoom or Teams? Uh, from a technology standpoint, everything that goes around the video visit to facilitate your practices workflows. And then critically, we haven't talked about it. it our implementations and our support teams, uh, they hold your hand through the entire process. Dr. Garza can attest to um, our team is with you for years. Uh, we don't just leave you to fend for yourself. I don't think I asked this before. Which EHRs do you integrate with? Uh, you did. And yeah, yeah. all of them, the, basically. Most, most all of them, yeah. Yeah. All right, perfect. Well, that's really all the time we have. Thank you for, very much for joining us. The recording and slides will be available after. If you have additional questions, uh, be sure to contact us uh, and uh, we will try to handle those offline. Thank you everyone for listening.